Um, hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us, joining us and raising a glass. Oh, look, uh, at right. first, look at Ian first, though. Look at Ian first. Look, there you go. Yeah, look at Ian. Well, everybody has these, uh, these fuzzy quarantine haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thanks for joining uh, me and Raising a Glass. Raising a Glass is a virtual education uh, series featuring wine boat suppliers and esteemed beverage professionals from all over the country. Um, if you're on this call, you know that today we'll be speaking with Jeffrey Karlovich, master blender and owner of Kayo Japanese Whiskey, about his history and the industry and uh, his whiskey. Um, Jeff is one of the most experienced, knowledgeable, and honestly wild whiskey professionals I've ever met. Uh, I learned something new every time I talk to him, so I'm really excited to have this opportunity for myself and everybody here. Um, I guess, uh, without further ado, uh, here's Jeff. Oh, wow. Uh, that's June. Thank you, Luke. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me fine? Okay, so um, a little bit about uh, myself. Uh, so we did this whole presentation, so I'm the master blender for Kaya Whiskey. Um, so I started um, uh, drinking whiskey at a quite young age. So I don't, I don't have some family lineage or anything like that or fifth generation, that's actually not me. Um, it was actually the only thing that actually my father never locked up. So when I was about 13 years old and I wanted to drink with my friends, whiskey was kind of the only thing I could actually can have. So I still remember a little story that um, I drank my bo uh, bottle of my father's whiskey uh, with a good friend of mine and we with, with a lot of Coca-Cola. Um, don't, don't hold that against me. And Basically, we're like, what do we do? My father drank Glenfiddich, which is kind of a square bottle or a kind of corny bottle that was green. And uh, we're like, what do we do? I'm like, well, water, food coloring. So we put water and food coloring. Um, didn't hear anything for a day. And then probably the next, like two days later, I heard my father yelling and screaming. Co totally true story. Uh, he basically starts yelling and screaming, goes up the stairs, and my older brother got the biggest beat down of his life. So that's basically started my kind of whiskey career and um, uh, I've never kind of looked back. So I've dedicated my life and my liver to the pursuit of um, great whiskey, not just Japanese whiskey, but all whiskeys all over. Um, but I'll start the presentation a little bit about uh, Kayo. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask, um, you know, I mean, listen, this is the only thing I know, uh, the only thing I'm good at. So, um, you know, so please ask any questions that you feel you see fit, but I'll show you the presentation a little bit. Let's talk a little bit more about the brand. Oh. I apologize, technical difficulties. It's all Sean's fault. Actually, I'm gonna take it. Do you, do you, do you hear me better now? Because yeah. I can't hear you. So, so basically, um, you know, Kyle, the vision of Kyle, um, the vision of Kyle was not to basically make a Japanese whiskey. Uh, it was to make the best whiskey, one of the best whiskeys in the world. Um, and I'm, I'm a truly believer of that. So when this was started out, I wanted to use the best distillate I possibly could. And with everything that I've learned in the industry, and I've been in the industry for a long time, uh, is basically that I gravitated towards Japanese whiskey before it was even fashionable. Uh, so to kind of give you kind of a history, like where did, where did Kyle come from? Kyle, like, I used to be the owner of Whiskey Life and Spirits Magazine, um, and uh, I have one of the largest whiskey collections, which you see, uh, you know, in, in the world, a uh, little north of over 4,800 4, bottles of single malt scotch. Um, and then that's, this is one bar in my house. I have another bar called The Dog House, which has about 1,500 bottles of whiskey, so Irish whiskeys, Japanese whiskeys. Uh, and uh, in 2006, um, I was fascinated by Japanese whiskey. And I did an article um, called Rising Suntory about how Japanese whiskey was uh, going to be, um, it, was, it was the most amazing thing that anybody's ever tried. And I don't know why anybody's actually ever not really gravitated to it because it's far superior than scotch whiskey. So it came to my, it came to my attention. If I wanted to start a brand, you always, you know, kind of like the Papa John's, better ingredients, better pizza. It's like better whiskey, you know, better ingredients, better whiskey. So I basically started saying like, if, if I was going to create a whiskey, would it be a Scotch whiskey? Even though I dedicated my life to Scotch and I worked for various different Scotch whiskey houses, you know, um, you know, I did, I did some work with you know Moore Hennessy, I did some work with uh, Bunahav and Deanston uh, Lechik, I did some work with McCallum, you know, the Glen, uh, the Glen Livet, uh, and I worked with various different companies in the industry. And I said, if I was going to come out with a true whiskey, um, and it came to my, you know, I would use Japanese distillate. 
So it was never trying to make a Japanese whiskey. It was trying to make the best whiskey in the world, and I want to start with the best ingredients. So, um, and one of the things that kind of led to me as a blender was I have all these 4,800 bottles of whiskey, and almost got, 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 kind of got boring for me. So I would blend on a daily basis in terms of blending different flavor profiles of what I wanted to see and how, in, how distilleries interacted with each other. So that was kind of the learning phase for me to basically create, um, you know, to kind of hone in my skills in terms of as a blender and, and work with different, different spirits and, and what the challenges would be. Um, I was just doing it for fun then. I had no clue 20 years ago that it would actually end into a career. Um, there was only, there, there's not many things I'm good at and drinking is one of them and obviously blending is one of them. Um, but, you know, it was actually honing the skill of blending uh, that got me to the point with Kyle. So, uh, so who's involved with Kayo? So basically, so I just told you that little story, but who's involved in Kayo? Um, you, know, you know, sometimes dumb luck plays a, a huge part in of who you meet along the way. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I always say that you're in a space for a reason. Uh, and who's involved in, I met um, Eric Hort, which was the president of Teltonia, which you might have heard of, uh, and Robert Leon, um, you know, over 10 years ago. So this is back, back in 2006. 2007 when I met these gentlemen. Uh, Robert Leon, so everybody doesn't know, he was the ex-president of LVMH for the first 20 years of his life. So Louis Vuitton, Moe Hennessy, he was the one that did all the deals. Um, he's one of the fifth, rich, fifth richest men in the world. Um, and uh, he believed, I actually were having a little lunch at, uh, you know, a little lunch, uh, and actually, and we were talking about different things. And he says, yo, Jeffy, uh, what is the next thing? I said, the next thing has got to be Japanese whiskey. Um, Japanese whiskey's distillate, he goes, oh, you build a brand, you build a brand. So that's basically how he started and basically gave me a blank check to create, and he believed in me and he believed in Eric uh, to actually make this dream become a reality. Uh, but the obstacle that I had faced was that I didn't know um, a lot of different things. A lot of people try to rush into developing brands and try to developing products. But um, I know what I didn't know, and what I didn't know was a lot. I didn't know uh, more about the sourcing side, more about the distribution side, and more about, uh, I needed to learn more about um, just the, the, the total scope of the category. I was just a lover of, you know, whiskeys at the point, and I was, you know, a collector and, and, a, and an amateur blender, and didn't really understand, you know, um, till later on, you know, where my talents would lie within this company. So, so basically, I was in, you know, they gave me this huge responsibility and, and a large checkbook, which was quite nice, uh, and to kind of create this company. Uh, and so my, my journey went to different, different companies. So I started working with the likes of, I started consulting for the likes of Moe Hennessy, um, the McAllen, the Glenlivet. I uh, started working with, um, very intimately with Buna Havan, Deanston, Sonia Mari Lechik. Uh, then our wench actually to the rum side. So went to uh, you know, Appleton Rum, uh, went to Angostura Rum, uh, and then worked with uh, you know um, Kelt Cognac, and that was kind of the, kind of the merger with Kelt Cognac, uh, with you know with you know with Eric, because he was trying to make me a cognac drinker, which I am now. Uh, but at the time, I was like, oh, cognac. Uh, but he was the one that kind of believed in my not the blending skills and where we were going with, and what we were doing with as a brand as a whole. So that's kind of like the story where, where I came in. And I also wanted to learn from some of the Japanese distillers. So I worked with the likes of uh, EY, Akashi, and Pichibu, um, you know, here in the United States. So uh, that's kind of a little bit of a, a little bit of a my background. Um, I'm also, I'm sure hopefully Monique's on this call as well. Um, but I, I was, uh, at the time, um, I was one of the youngest keepers of the quakes ever inducted. So I'm a keeper of the quake, uh, which is, uh, basically a, a nice way to people to recognize you um, for your scotch whiskey knowledge um, and normally it's a surprise and, uh, and it was a great honor um, that was bestowed on me um, you know over 10 years ago uh, so uh, that's a little bit about me but we'll talk a little bit more about the brand so how you know um, the Kyle, Kyle whiskey was um, this year we're actually very excited about was voted the top 14 whiskey of the world in 2019 and that's our signature um, which is I'm very proud of which I'll talk I'll talk a little bit more about in in, in the slideshow and I hate kind of slideshows because uh, but we're all virtual so I'm more throwing whiskey around and having a good time uh, but this is a little bit different in this in this space uh, why I why this was so important to, uh, to me was it not just the recognition was that we were I thought we were on the right path um, I think 
people too many times try to innovate. And I always say innovation is the death of whiskey. And the reason why I say that is make a great whiskey first and then innovate and then experiment. If you can't make a great whiskey first as your base, then your experiments are just covering up what you're trying or masking what your, your, your faults as a blender or as your distillate or how, how you're maturing the whiskey. You know, that is kind of, um, you know, so when we received this award, I finally felt some validation that we were on the right track, that we could start experimenting. We can start some doing some different things. And we can, and look, listen, I, I, I'll show you some things that later in this present, uh, later in the slideshow, that um, I would love to say all my experiments work and they're the most amazing things in the world. Uh, but I will tell you that's absolutely not true. Uh, um, some of them are complete, uh, can I say shit? So is that, is that allowed? Um, what, what, not good, okay, so, so not good. But some of them are actually amazing. So we're try I'm trying to push the envelope, but also understanding um, how whiskey is made throughout the stages. So many people make that mistake going into making whiskey. Um, that they want to do different things and different flavor profiles, but you need to start making a great whiskey first before you can kind of evolve. And that's kind of where um, this, this award meant so much to us being voted top 14. Um, so what makes uh, Japanese whiskey different? Because I get that question a lot. So I kind of wanted to show people what makes Japanese whiskey different. So there's kind of, in, in, on the distillation process, there's kind of three main differences between, um, now listen, not everybody, ever, like listen, not everybody holds the same principles. You know, we normally talk about Scotch whiskey, you know, distilled twice and Irish whiskey distilled three times. And, you know, and then everybody says, you know, the, the Scotch whiskey did it right on the second time. And, and the Irish will say the Scotch were too cheap to do it on a third time. But um, most Japanese whiskeys are basically follow the Scotch whiskey principle with some, with some differences. So basically, I'm gonna show you a little, um, little, little video here. So, Basically, the, the, one, the one main difference is when you have your barley and you soak it with water to start to germinate and to create those sugars, you know, and then they stop, the, they stop that germination process, you know, to uh, basically, uh, you know, kill the barley so they can actually, uh, you know, basically break down that barley into grist, you know, and then from that grist, you know, they put it in their mash tun. So, and the, or they want to basically, you know, put um, basically barley yeast in water. So you want to put yeast to that. So, but the, the obstacle with, you know, with that, the difference between Scotch whiskey and, the, and Japanese whiskey is the liquid that actually comes out of it. Um, now people say, well, it's the same process. How can the process be different? The process is different because you'll basically have your mash tun. And then when it's re you're ready to take that water from the mash tun, basically think of a coffee filter. Uh, basically, it's coming out of that coffee filter, and it'll be cloudy, and then it'll get clear. Okay, the Japanese whis Japanese feel that it's impure, so they will not use that cloudy part. They will actually discard that. Okay, uh, they will only use they will only use the pure part of what they feel is um, you know worthy of actually making whiskey. So they're actually very 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 precise. So now I'll show you the differences between the next differences between. Um, the, the distillation. Now, one, no, not, not every the Japanese whiskey distiller, you know, b believes in this ideal, but most of them do. So when you actually, you're, you're coming from your wash still, so you have your wash still, you have your, your spirit heating up, uh, and then basically you have the heart of that run, and then you have your, you know, your, your, your highs and your lows, uh, and then before it goes into spirit still, so normally you'll use your faints to actually uh, go into your spirit still to charge your spirit still. They will not do that. They will discard the faints because they think it's unpure. They will only use the heart of the run to actually charge their still. So they're the wastage of Japanese whiskey, believe it, and they're not a wasted, they, they're normally not about waste, but they're, but they're also about pure harmony. They're trying to make the best spirit possible. So one of the, so one of the things that they do is try to make something um, that is as pure as possible from the stages. And one of the interesting things here too, if you look at uh, basically the condenser, now in, in Scotch whiskey, it's basically anything that's coming off the burn is basically the temperature that's going, that water that's going off the, the um, basically column still. And there's a couple other people that do it differently in the world that kind of do what the Japanese do. Uh, but what Japanese will do is they will cool that water before, in that condenser 
So it's completely consistent. So they know the exact phase of what they're getting at every single time. There's no variable. So they're one of the only ones that actually take the condenser and actually make sure there's a set temperature that's going through that. It's not just water from, you know, you know, from the lock or from the burn um, or what, what have you. So those are the main differences between um, Scotch whiskey and Japanese whiskey uh, as a whole. They, they're trying to make a more um, pure spirit, uh, but in doing so, they make a more delicate spirit. But they're kind of in the realm of everybody says, well, what's Japanese whiskey and, I, and, and the differences between Japanese whiskey, uh, Scotch whiskey and Irish whiskey. So you have Jap Scotch whiskey on one side and you have Irish whiskey in the middle or on the right side, you have Japanese whiskey kind of in there. I think it's the best of both worlds. I think they actually made an unbelievable, unbelievable product. And hence why um, when I was creating a brand, I wanted to um, basically make a whiskey from it. And then everybody says like, well, why Miss Our Oak? Uh, Miss Our Oak was, I was very fortunate to work with some amazing people. And I was very fortunate to have some amazing jobs in the industry. And one of my jobs was working with different oaks and experimenting with different oaks for, uh, for a company. And uh, basically it came out that I actually fell in love with Mizanar Oak. Uh, and I said, I thought it was the best, best vessel to ever make whiskey in. But the problem was the cost. Uh, and the cost was, the difference would be given, can I put that in perspective? The cost was um, up to, uh, you know, basically your bourbon barrel is 500 new, or brand new American oak barrels, 500 new, or you can find them for 350. Uh, a good sherry barrel anywhere from 600 to 1100 $1,200. You know, a good Limazon oak barrel anywhere from 800 to $1,500. Now, these started at the time when we were started buying barrels was $2,800 a barrel. Now, they're anywhere from $5,500 to $7,000 a piece. So they're the most expensive oak um, barrels in the world because everybody feels about that aging this spear is, is the finest vessel. Now, what makes Kaya whiskey different than everybody else is we we knew this a long time ago. <laughs> this is not new to the game, and we've been working with um, Mizanar Oak for a long time. So we're not a finish. A lot of our, some of our whiskeys will finish. Everything that we do will touch Mizanar Oak in some way, shape, or form. Uh, however, we have, we're kind of the only products on the market that are truly 100% Mizanar. And everybody says, well, that's impossible. And I will tell you, it's, it's not impossible. We're trying to make great whiskey. You know, and everybody says, well, you know, Mizanar, the difference between Mizanar, it's, it's kind of the oils that are in it. It lacks oil enzymes to, to actually uh, make the barrel seal. So when you talk about, you know, your regular bourbon barrel, you know, basically this is kind of the thickness of the stave. So, so I have actually some, some barrels behind me. Um, it's kind of stuff to make it this way. Uh, what can you do? Uh, but a Mizanar oak barrel is twice as thick. So, and the reason they do that, so now think about twice as thick. It's actually much harder to bend much harder to create. Uh, and, and the obstacle that you'll have is it's also very porous. And, and using, and basically those casts are twice as heavy um, because they're twice as thick. And hence why they're so expensive. Uh, but we, we kind of wanted to be as authentic as possible. We want to use Japanese distillate. So what is, what is Kaya whiskey? Kaya whiskey doesn't have a distillery. We don't have a distillery um, yet because we're in the process of actually doing that as we speak. Uh, but Kaiwa buys new make spirits. So we age all our spirits. So we buy from multiple different distilleries um, across Japan, but new make spirit. And then we lay it down in our, in our cast. So we're not buying any finished product. So we're trying to buy, or we're basically aging and have the entire control of our entire portfolio, what we have in a warehouse. And that's one of the things that's kind of unique to us. We started this a long time ago uh, when, it, when Japanese whiskey wasn't fashionable. But we thought it was the best ingredient to use, kind of like Wagyu beef. You know, everybody is a big Wagyu beef fan because of how crazy it is, and everybody's trying to replicate it. Um, you know, we were kind of on that forefront of actually doing that. Um, so that's one of the the, uh, the things about um, I thought Mizanar Oak was one of the best to use uh, in the world. Um, but I'll show you a little video. Most people don't know what um, I've ever actually seen a Mizanar Oak tree, what it actually looks like. So. Uh, so what you're looking at, um, this is a, a Mizanaro tree. Now, they have to, unfortunately, they have to be about 200 years old before you can actually harvest them. You can see how they grow and different angles and different things to actually harvest them. But every, cut, every tree that, we, that is harvested for our barrels, we, we plant a new barrel. Now, I will never see that tree to mature um, because only if, if, if science gets up there or the whiskey keeps me great, fantastic. But here's all our staves. So these are our staves that we have. 
Um, and then this is our cooperage. Now our cooperage is Ariake. Now we, we basically buy 70% of their annual production. So we're one, we're one of the largest purveyors of uh, missing oak barrels in the world. Now you saw the fire before. The fire before, there's no science. There's no, there, it's basically just coal. But the way I like the barrels, you'll see in a second, um, you know, very scientific right here. Uh, they, I like my barrels between two and three char because it's about 22 sugars we like, I like to pull out from the, from the barrels and from the whiskey. So, um, so this is one of our Mizanar barrels being made. So you can kind of, kind of see the char level that we're basically looking at. Um, I don't like a heavy char because I don't want the, the wood to dominate the spirit because Japanese whiskey is very delicate. Um, it doesn't hold up as uh, longer with wood as Scotch whiskey does, but it's a little bit longer than Irish whiskey. So these are barrels um, that are made ready to go to us. And some of, most of them are Mizanara, but there's some interesting barrels that are down below uh, that experiments. You know, so this is um, one of our, our new mixed spirit uh, being poured into our Kaira barrels um, that we have. And this is whiskey that we come, come back from the ocean maturation, which I'll explain the ocean maturation in a little bit of what we do. And then here's our warehouse. So you can imagine, you think about $7,000, every barrel that's on the left uh, and or actually on the right, most of them on the left are um, $7,000 a piece. Uh, those two barrels right there are um, Cori, the chestnut barrels. Then we get into our sherry barrels on the left-hand side, Pedro Jimenez. Now this is only one part of our warehouse. We have multiple casks in our warehouse and we have multiple warehouses um, that are there. And I think uh, uh, Sean Nelson actually has his own barrel in that, and that is the only one in the entire company that actually is, has his own barrel besides uh, the founder's daughters. Um, and then we have our peated casks uh, that we have laid down here, um, which we'll talk about the peat. And then, and then the, the difference is why we're different uh, and why those, why those barrels are different. They're not, they're not really bourbon barrels. They're a little bit different. We'll talk about them in a second. And then, and then we go back into the Mizanara. Um, the difference between um, if they're a black head or an orange head is because um, the black head means that um, they were made for us. They were made by the same cooperage. Uh, the orange head means that I've expect, I, I was there when those barrels were made. Um, so basically here's our bourbon room. So it kind of shows you the bourbon barrels that we have, you know, laid down with our spirit. So, uh, but we, we're, we do a lot of different things at Cayo. So one of the things that we do is we do a lot of experiments and people do with like cherry blossom. Now listen, cherry blossom is a love and hate relationship. I'm not gonna tell you every experiment's great, but there's some things about Sakura that I really like. Uh, here's me pouring a barrel of Sakura. And that's our, um, our range of whiskeys, which we'll get into um, right now uh, after we get into the ocean maturation. So what does Kyle mean? Kyle means ocean. Uh, and it was born because of um, the ocean maturation. Uh, I'll get to, the, get to the next slide. Um, uh, is that ocean maturation especially bullshit? Um, can, can I say that, HR director? So, you know, basically that was my question. And that was a question that basically came to me. I'm like, because uh, I started being the blender for Pell Cognac. And like, oh, you know, we do this ocean maturation. And it's the most, most amazing thing. And I'm the most skeptical person in the world because I've seen it all in whiskey. I've seen different things. I've seen it all in different spirits. So I'm like, total bullshit. Um, it's just a, a marketing gimmick. Uh, but I said, okay, so listen, if, if I believe in this concept and I believe in ocean maturation, now I'm the blender for this company and that's what their selling point is. Uh, so, so listen, let me do one thing. Let me blend all this cognac together. Um, and we then go on the ocean maturation because you can have different barrels that you put on a, on a, uh, on an ocean maturation. They're all going to come back different because you'll have barrels in the warehouse that are completely different. But three months sea voyage with the same liquid, there shouldn't be much variable. So it should be a little bit, but it shouldn't be extreme. Now I will tell you, um, when it came back, I was a total believer. Now, I'm not gonna say that the ocean maturation is the best thing since sliced bread, because that would be a lie. There is about 70 to 80% of the cast that come back are truly amazing that have transformed. But there's about 20% that are like, eh, okay. Then we kind of push them aside. So, and then where, why I decided to do this with Cayo was because of the Mizanar Oak. Now the Mizanar Oak um, gives a lot of flavor for the first year. So if you think about like tea bags and and different, you know, like, um, you know, making yourself a cup of tea. You know, the first time you use it, you get a, you know, a lot of flavor, second time, third time, you know, less flavor, less flavor. You know, similar with, you know, your bourbon barrels and your sherry barrels. 
So now with Mizanara, you get a lot of flavor from the first three years and then it basically goes dormant. So I said, how do I recreate that flavor profile or to reactivate it? Because it starts picking back up when it's five years old. So hence why we started doing the ocean maturation with Kyle. And when it came back, I was truly like blown away by the flavor profiles that it was giving me. And it was a lot of flavor profile you get from this hour is a lot of sandalwood and, and, and a lot of oak. But the nuances and the beauty of it is like the third and second time that we're talking about with that feedback. As though those other casts decline, this hour actually kind of lifts up. So I said, how can I get those flavor profiles? Hence why the ocean maturation was there because I like exotic, you know, like almost people say like, Oh, it's like Bob Marley in a glass. It's like, you know, I get this exotic fruit and all these other crazy stuff. Um, and, but, but you'll get a lot of coconut and you have some different flavors that are really true to the Mizanara um, that'll come out during the ocean maturation. And hence why we decided to do ocean maturation with Kaya. And hence hey, why we actually named it. Jeff, I hate to interrupt. Um, I have a question. Um, what is your evaporation rate on Mizanara? Oh, the evaporation on the rate of Mizanara. So basically, the normal evaporation is about 3% um, for different spirits. So we normally get, um, we basically get that same evaporation, but in a different spell. We get about anywhere from six to seven percent a year. So basically, three percent goes to the angels and four percent goes to hell because every barrel leaks um, in some way, shape, or form. But they always plug their leaks. So that's one thing that's kind of unique about. So we, we lose a little bit more, um, but we don't mind losing more for the final product. So. Um, one, and then we'll, we'll look a little bit about the Kaya range. So the Kaya range, here's our core range, which is our signature, so, uh, which is right here. Um, this is uh, the, the staple of Kaya of, of, you know, this is, no, oh, excuse me. Did I just burp on camera? Jesus. <laughs> so, uh, is, it, so basically this was the, the you know, the Kaya. Um, they're, you know, the, the basically the, our signature. Um, which we call now basically it does you know at the time when we first launched it, it was um, anywhere from five to six years old now it's eight to nine years old in terms of the maturation because uh, everything that we're trying to do is we're trying to make this, the, our core range with our signature and our cash strength like the best whiskey possible so it will it, it will change you know in time but we're trying to make it better and better and better in each step and in, in, in each fashion of it what's kind of unique about this is or well, unique about us between other Japanese whiskeys, it does not touch any other spirit except Mizanara. Um, and there's not many ever that can claim that. Can claim that. Uh, and then this one that we said earlier, top 20 whiskey in the world by um, Whiskey Advocate, uh, and it got 92 points. Uh, and it was the highest rated Japanese whiskey of last year. Uh, so this is what we're very proud of. And that kind of our base of our company um, is our car signature. So, the next in our range, which is April Monique's on the call, I don't know if she's on, on or not, but this is kind of, um, you know, uh, this is just me being a geek because I love whiskey. And, you know, like, hey, you know, I'll throw that whiskey and we'll pour some cash strength. So, um, uh, so basically, the cash strength was a window of what, what basically the Mizanara actually did. So, I wanted people to experience whiskey right from the barrel in terms of the flavor profile that I'll give. The depth, the richness. So, hence where um, you know the you know the kind of the cash rank was born. Um, this one, uh, best best whiskey of 2019, best of show, uh, and it won best Japanese whiskey of 2019. Won right? won numerous awards, uh, 90 points from Whiskey Advocate. Uh, but you know, if there's a whiskey, everyone says, "Well, what whiskey do you, do you like?" I, say, I always say the last one that's in my glass. Uh, but um, if there's one that I drink quite too, quite too much of. Uh, it would be the cash strength. So if I start slurring at the end of this presentation, you kind of know why. Um, so, and then we'll get into the single. So uh, the single is kind of out of a life of its own. Uh, and the reason for the, sing the, the, the single to be is because, hey, uh, we actually have to actually make a company. <laughs> and the Mizanara Oak, um, it's a great proposition and we, we do everything in Mizanara Oak. But we had all this, we, we couldn't, there, there's only 500 barrels that are actually made a year uh, of Mizanara barrels. So you, and we have 75% of that. So the amount of whiskey that we're actually buying to lay down does not compute with that if our company wants to grow. So we need to expand in, in different avenues. And we, of course, we spent in, in American Oak, but I wanted to kind of touch Mizanara Oak. And, and I found some really fascinating things about the, about 
talk about right now. So this is our single, which is our entry level, basically um, seven years old. Uh, we put our, it's the only one we put an age statement on. Everybody's taking age statements off, uh, but my goal um, for a brand, um, we're unshield filtered, uncolored, and our, our vision of a brand is actually putting age statements back on while everybody's taking them off. Uh, unfortunately, with, with the, uh, the uncertainty with Ms. Nara and the flavor profile, we're not just there yet, but we will be. And we'll start putting age statements on, on our whiskey moving forward. So, so we'll talk a little bit about the single. So this was done first maturation um, in bourbon, does this ocean maturation as an era, uh, hits bourbon again, and then goes to first maturation in um, Japanese as our oak. Now the one that was basically out was completely, um, which was fine, it's good, but I'm like, can I make it better? Uh, so basically what I did was, did some experiments, and there's actually an experiment behind me. So, so right here, if you can see, so, oh, I'm moving down. so this is a basically experimental. Don't mind my pink pants. Hey, no men wear pink, just remember that. So, basically, my experiment was um, I wanted more depth and more character with, uh, you know, ba basically for the single. And they saw it lack a little bit more dimension the way that, and, it, and it couldn't compete with the signature. So what I did was I aged it in new, new Japanese Mizanaro oak to give it a little bit more flavor. Normally it was first fill. So it was new, getting a lot of different flavor, but like then, then the Mizanaro kind of took over. I'm like, well, how can I counter out that? I wanted some new uh, kind of nuances to bring kind of the bourbon characteristic back. So we did uh, pickle barrels. So this is a, it's basically uh, a test or an experiment that I did right in the office. So it took me about two years to get to this. So the new single was born out of this, which is basically you're um, re-aging the, re the whiskey in, um, you know, big old barrels. And what's kind of unique about this whiskey I, I know I spend way too much time on this whiskey because I'm, I'm, I'm happy about the evolution. We talked earlier about the evolution. We're trying to make the best whiskey and we're trying to keep involved in, you know, in our whiskey to evolve and trying to make the best whiskey spirit just across the board. And what excites me the most about this one was but the flavor profile from you get from the Zanara, you'll normally get this flavor profile when it's 12, 13, 14 years old. You actually seem a little bit younger in the single, which is really, really nice. Um, but we wanted we wanted to make something that we reason why for the the aging back into bourbon, you know we wanted to make sure that it was balanced and, and it had harmony throughout throughout the process. So so anyway, so anyway, compile everyone. So I'll go to the next slide. I won't spend much time, but this is our peated. So our peated is um, this, I, I creatively acquired this recipe from a foreign employee. So this is one of the most peated whiskeys that's on the market, 35 parts per million. Um, but but if you're, I, I we created a Japanese peated whiskey because I like peated whiskey. So I wanted a peated whiskey to drink. Um, that was basically uh, that was basically simple. And they said, well, can we sell it? I'm like, oh yeah, sure, no problem. So but it was me wanting to have a, a peated whiskey. So uh, it's 35 parts per million. But how do I, you know, Japanese whiskey is always about harmony and balance. So how do I do that? The flavor profile. So I, I, you know, basically acquired this knowledge from a former, you know, for a person that or for a company that former worked for. Uh, and if you put heavily peated whiskey in the beer casks for the first two years of its life, it basically cuts the peat in half. But you get peat layers throughout the entire process. So I said to myself, I said, that's it. So let's put it in the beer cask for the first. But it's, so this is the only one that doesn't basically sit for three years before it goes on solution sort of maturation. Just for two years, then it goes in or for its ocean maturation in Mizanaro Oak, and then it basically sits in Mizanaro Oak for five years before it's bottled. And what you'll get is basically sweet tea, so basically citrus, honey, and vanilla, um, which is absolutely fantastic. And if Monique's on this call, um, there's a barrel behind me that might interest you, um, which we'll talk about in a second. So, uh, and then. But the, the last in our range is the sherry, and which is basically if, if I had a calling card and you know, I thought was my iconic whiskey, uh, which was the sherry, it was probably the most the hardest whiskey for me to actually create. Oh, there he is, there. You know, it was one of the hardest whiskeys for me to create. Um, 
It basically it was in a lot of roasted sherry. All the roasted sherry is very strong in flavor. Um, Mizanaro is very strong in flavor, uh, especially the best honeymoon. Um, and then you get married. Don't you know? But marriage is great. I'm not saying that marriage is great. But um, there's always a give and take, uh, and sometimes some can dominate and some cannot. So basically, Mizanaro can dominate the sherry flavor um, if it's if it's not taken out of character. Well. Um, this is one of the things that I thought was happening. So what we did was we actually put it in Pedro Jimenez casks for five months to bring the sherry flavor back. Uh, and what it turned out to be was one of my favorite whiskeys that's in our portfolio, but very limited like the last one. So um, one of the things that was kind of unique about what we do for this coming year, we have a private barrel program. So we have 60 barrels that are coming out to the US um, that are private barrels. Those are the barrels that you actually see in, in the presentation. So these are the barrels that were hand selected by me. Um, there are one is full Mizanara and one that's been uh, finished in Mizanara uh, that will be coming to the market um, for, for this year and for next year. And one of the kind of unique things that we do um, is we're also launching, um, uh, we talk about experimenting and doing different things, but more people are going to be able to create their own blends with me uh, and with our team. And we have a Mizanara Oak, 100% Mizanara Oak, uh, one done is bourbon, one does in Corey, which is um, our chestnut. And one is done in Sakura. Um, and uh, the people actually can blend different levels. Uh, and we can actually work and actually make a private blend uh, for them and, 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 for, and whoever wants it. Uh, now, these were hand selected by me. So, uh, so failure is, is on the low side. Uh, but we'll, we'll try to guide people to actually make it uh, something that's kind of unique, something to them. But one of the fortunate things for my life was um, actually blending. And I think everybody should try it and everybody should do it. Uh, if you love whiskey, um, you know, it, every, life is about failure and getting up and, and trying new things and trying being adventurous. And if I never try, was adventurous with my own collection and wanted to ruin that 30 year old Lafroy, um, you know, I would have never been here today. So I want to give a window of, of what's, you know, of my passion and what's made me successful, um, you know, to a point. But, <laughs> well, you know, basically of what we're actually doing. And, um, give people the opportunity uh, that I was very fortunate to have. So, um, so people say like, well, how many distilleries do you source from? Um, we source from numerous different distilleries, um, but there's, all, there's normally, normally two that we have long-term contracts with, but um, there's five that we buy by new mixed spirit. So we buy new mixed spirit and we actually age all our stuff ourselves. Now, um, one, of the, one of the unique things about our company is we're trying to buy from every Japanese distillery before, we actually, before our distillery is actually built. Um, so we will have at one time the largest collection of all the Japanese whiskey distilleries uh, in one house at one time, which will be a huge, amazing feat. Um, and I'm sure uh, that'll be quite interesting moving forward uh, that, you know, of, of the different distillates that we actually have. Uh, and then what is the blending process? The blending process is real simple. I, I'm, not, I'm not Japanese, but um, I chose Japanese spirits, so I need to uh, make sure that I honor their tradition and what they set out for uh, and what they're trying to achieve. And it's always about balance and harmony. Right? And we try to do that with all our whiskey from, from the nose to the palate to the finish. And that's kind of the main, if, if, if there was one um, or two, th two words I can say about Japanese whiskey, it's about balance and harmony. It's about making something that's balanced and, harm and has harmony throughout the entire spirit. And that's what I'm, sh I'm striving for. Sometimes I'm not successful, but I'm trying as best I can. Um, so what is the future of the evolution of Kelt? Um, what we talked about earlier, uh, making great whiskey first and then experiment. If you don't make, like I have great friends in this industry that spend a lot of money and I'll buy, mm. uh, and, and, uh, and I always say, make a great whiskey first and then experiment and then do some crazy things. Uh, if you can't do that, then you'll never have a core. You'll never have a value of the company moving forward. Um, and what is our goal? Our goal is, you know, keep improving our current range. Uh, and never stopping trying to improve it. it. Everything can be improved. Everything can be better. Uh, and you shouldn't strive for, oh, this is great. Because we've won 14, about 14 whiskey, am I settled? Absolutely not. We need to make it better. Um, you know, we need to be number one. Um, don't know if we'll ever get there, but that's our goal. Uh, and, you know, and, uh, and you know, going and leading into that as we're exciting to experiment. Uh, yes, we're, we are experimenting in different types of woods that we have uh, for Kyo. Um, now, I will love to tell you, I said earlier, that all my experiments are absolutely amazing. Um, that would be complete 
total lie. Uh, I will tell you that there's some experiments that are um, truly amazing, and some of them what we we've just wasted that whiskey, and that's fine. Um, but just because you do it doesn't mean you need to bottle it. And that was taught to me by a great man in the whiskey industry, by Mel Hennessy. Um, just because you do it doesn't mean you need to bottle it. And um, we will not bottle everything that we make because we're trying to make great whiskey. We're trying to make interesting whiskey, but we're trying to make great whiskey. We're not trying to, like well, I said earlier, we're not trying to make Japanese whiskey, um, even though we're trying to use a Japanese dis distillate. Uh, we're trying to make the best whiskey we possibly can as a company. Jeff, uh, can, you talk, can you talk about like uh, you're working on a special product uh, project with Disney actually um, right now? Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, so basically, um, Disney came to us about making um, the most. They, they viewed us as the most authentic Japanese whiskey out there because we do Japanese oak um, with Japanese distillate, uh, and um, they vetted us quite heavily. So we're actually doing a private. We've done a lot of work with Disney, but we're doing a private whiskey. Um, for them, which is um, called Cayo uh, Mate, uh, and will be exclusively only available at Disney and the, you know and the Disney property. So we're basically making a whiskey exclusively for them uh, for our product, and it was a huge honor. Um, didn't expect that we were, were going to receive that honor, uh, but it was a huge honor for us as a company. Um, you know, not in terms of dollars or, or, or value, but in terms of what we're trying to do is as authentic as possible, and that's what we're trying to do is what. Uh, we we want to be as you know basically um, transparent as possible of what we're doing and how we're doing it, and uh, that was a huge honor for us uh, to actually achieve that. And actually get to do that. That's a that's an honestly a great segue into talking about uh, just some of the fantastic stuff you guys have been doing for our industry, um, and the commitment that you've made to uh, all our um, unfortunate uh, on premise. Uh, friends that have been without jobs for a while. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Powered by yeah. Kaya? I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, one thing is, I don't know if Monique's on the, on the thing, but I need to show her this barrel real quick. So this barrel right here, uh, hopefully she's on. Um, this barrel is a whiskey that's actually coming to you. So this is actually our peated whiskey and Pedro Menesca. So, um, if you don't, I need to get going. Sean, you've been drinking too much whiskey. So basically, so that's our page. Give me one second. There's, there's more one place. Sorry. If anybody doesn't know, this is a hangman. So basically, the Irish would put actually this on the on the bottle. You know, um, the Scotch whiskey would have a dog because it's made of a copper with a copper pen, uh, copper penning on the bottom. So this is called a hangman. Jeffrey, this is mean. This is a mean thing to do to just show us all this and we can't even taste it. I'm in the car. I'm picking up dinner for the Benny's team and I literally just parked. So I'm not doing anything dangerous. But the second I heard you say that, I knew what you were up to. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is, um, I will send you a sample and a, and a couple of bottles of this. So this is- uh, You're the best, man. And Pedro Jimenez. So uh, I thought you would enjoy this and you would like this. I know you're not a huge Sherry fan, but I'm like, you know what? I need to make her a believer. So, um, you know, so this is, uh, this is my Monique whiskey. Oh, I love you. <laughs> I can't wait to try it, buddy. That's awesome. Yeah, same here. Same here. Okay, I'm, I'm going to deliver dinner. I'm here. listening. I'm, I'm listening right the whole time. So no more cussing because I can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That, that's a that's a hard time with me. I, I'm I'm an HR nightmare. I, if you haven't realized that yet, sure. that's why you're your own HR department. <laughs> well, Greg, Greg's in charge of our HR, and, and you've seen Greg. <laughs> that's that's troubling. That's really troubling. I'll be back on, but I'm running dinner. You guys, all right. Keep up. Good. You guys are killing. All right. So so basically, talking about um what we do is um about about, about window being a blender. So this is our blending actually course that we actually do for people um, that we actually in, immerse them into actually blending. It's not a fluff course. It's basically, uh, basically, if you were a blender, how would you blend and then pitfalls that you will have and, and actually trying a process to actually make a great whiskey. So this is something that we do across the nation. So hopefully everybody that's here that can attend that soon. So, but going back to Luke's point of view. Um, so this is our initiative that we have for Powered by Kai. 
So Powered by Kyle was started because of, um, you know, basically we're all, we're all virtual right now. We're all at our homes um, because of the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, this was, uh, you know, this was created, everybody's been touched by this. Everybody's, every, every line has been changed by this. So this was created to uh, give back to the community that's been so good to us. You know, we were very fortunate as a company to have a lot of success in 2019 and we need to share that. You know, so you know, basically our, or 2019, 2020. So this is uh, Powered by Kyo. So what Powered by Kyo is, is anybody, if you're a bartender in the industry uh, and you're in the industry, you basically just make a cocktail, uh, take a picture of it, and we send you $100. Um, so it gets you quicker than the stimulus check that you'll get from the government. Um, and it, it doesn't matter if it's the worst cocktail in the world or the best cocktail in the world. Uh, it's not about the brand. It's not about anything. It's about basically supporting the people that need the support the most. Um, now I will tell you, uh, I really didn't know that when we started this project. Uh, I really, I, I didn't really, it was a great idea and, and I felt good about doing it. Um, and then Jay, who was really instrumental in putting this together along with the whole Kyle team, um, we lost someone that was very dear to us uh, from Corona-19. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm Mike Walsh from Massachusetts and it still has sh shooken me to my core and um, we originally were, gonna, we were capping this amount of people that we had, uh, and we actually took the cap off because if we can help people in this time of need, it was, it was worthwhile to, to support people in, um, you know, and, and uh, try to give back of what we can do. We're not a big company uh, by any stretch of imagination, but it was, it was something that we could do to help people and to ease their pain or buy their groceries for a week or do something. That's what we're trying to do. But um, so if I'm going to do a toast, um, you know, here's to here's to Michael, a good friend of mine, um, and uh, I love you to death. And um, the angels are not going to be happy seeing you because you're going to take over whiskey. Um, but uh, you know, I, I will see you soon, but not yet. And uh, I love you. So uh, thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, I, I, I need to do one more thing before you yeah. go. And I, so um, uh, so why is Kyle successful? And it's basically the misfit. Um, I would not be successful without the team that I have. And they're the most amazing people that I've ever actually had the pleasure of working with. Uh, and I have a lot of shortcomings in life. And I have the most major shortcomings. You see me. I am a, I'm a freaking basket case. Uh, and um, they help me be me. And that is Sean Nelson, um, you know, Jay Cole, um, you, know, uh, you know, Greg Mayer, and um, Ricky. Uh, Ricky Lynn. Um, they help me become, you know, help make. They're the one. They're the reason why Kyle's successful, not me. They, they, they're, they're the, they're the backbones of, of what makes it true. So I feel like they're all most of you. <laughs> we love each and every one of you. Uh, you have an amazing team. Uh, we, uh, I definitely agree with that. Um, very special people to me too. Um, but talking about Power by Kyle, we had some really amazing. Um, submissions and we're lucky enough to have one of my good friends um, and uh, a bartender from Miami that submitted a great cocktail. Um, Do I need to stop sharing? What's that? Do I need to uh, stop sharing? Oh, oh, I already you, did. You took over. oh, that's the host, the host power. Um, but yes, so uh, Gustavo Martinez is here with us. Um, I think I have an unmuted. Gustavo, can we hear you? Yeah, everything's well. How are things awesome, going? perfect. Uh, Gustavo is an, an amazing bartender here in Miami. He just uh, opened a new restaurant um, on Lincoln Ave called Mila. It's absolutely spectacular. Um, but yeah, he uh, submitted a, an amazing cocktail for us and I think he's gonna make that for us now. Unfortunately, you won't be able to get to enjoy it until you uh, stop by Miami and uh, visit me at Mila. But uh, I will go through the steps of uh, how I created this cocktail. Um, so thank you very much for choosing me this evening. And once again, my name is Gustavo Martinez. I am the lead bartender at Mila Restaurant here in Miami Beach, Florida. And tonight I will be presenting the Peated Pina Highball. Um, I took the steps of uh, selecting an Amaro and the Amaro I've selected is a roasted pineapple Amaro by Heirloom. And we're going to start off with half an ounce of that. Okay. 
and Jeffrey, two of my favorite Caillou whiskeys are both the the single. So we're using half oh, now. Oh, I love you. I love you already. And we're using half an ounce of the single and a full ounce of the peated, adding a little more smoke, which is great for Miami and this beautiful heat. And the reason why I chose to do a highball this evening or for this cocktail was because it's so refreshing here in the Miami atmosphere, something that's capable of being um, perfectly balancing for both of these whiskeys, as well as for the Amaro. But there's nothing better than nothing but a little mineral water or sparkling water topped off with a splash of whiskey to better your day. Now we are going to finish this cocktail with a little fresh mint. A slight agitation in between, just to incorporate. And a few elegant flowers to add to this cocktail. And I present to you the peated pineapple highball. Cheers, Gustavo. Thank you so much. That looks delicious. Um, I can't wait to come to Mila and uh, try it out there. Um, more, than, more than one. More than one. <laughs> Thanks, Gustavo. Thanks again. Uh, Jeff, um, I really appreciate you coming on uh, today. Um, it, you, you make, you blend some amazing whiskeys and, and we're, we're really excited about, uh, to be a partner of yours and, uh, to move forward with you in the future and see what you produce, uh, coming up. We're all, we're all really, really excited. Well, actually, I actually feel a little embarrassed. Gustavo was all nicely dressed and I'm in like, <laughs> like powered by t Kyle t shirts So, uh, I'm a little, little outdone right now, but thanks Gustavo. I'll remember that. So, uh, but yeah, uh, thank you for, um, for having me. Um, you know, listen, we're all in this, we're all in this crazy time together and thank you for putting this together. And, uh, you know, I have, you know, listen, you know, world peace, one dram at a time. I say, you know. Yeah. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, for everybody watching, uh, please go follow, uh, Kayo whiskey on Instagram. Um, they actually extended their powered by Kayo program till, uh, tomorrow at five o'clock. Correct. I believe, yes. Yeah. So um, if you are a bartender and you uh, want $100, uh, go and make a Cayo cocktail. If you click on the link in their bio on their Instagram, you'll get all the details. Uh, submit it and uh, get yourself a check. Make some money. Um, also, thank you all for joining us on uh, Raising a Glass. We, will, we are continuing with this program. Please go to our Instagram for Raising a Glass, wb.raisingaglass on Instagram. Uh, up, Coming up, we have May 5th, we have El Bujo Mezcal. Uh, should be pretty, pretty awesome. And on the 8th, I think, um, we have uh, Jay Rieger out of Kansas City. And that's going to be a really, really great uh, informative uh, thing, too. Ricky Lynn is doing prep work in, uh, <laughs> at his restaurant in Utah while, while we're on the call. Um, <laughs> but uh, what's up? Can I, can I say one thing, too? If anybody has any questions about Kyle or anything like that, yeah, um, yeah. it's the only time I actually feel smart. So um, my email address is jeffrey at lhkspirits.com. Um, and you can reach out to Sean if you know him. Um, my phone number is 917-620-7360. So if you have any questions about the brand, so it's 917-620-7360. Just don't call me at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, and we're all good. Uh, but listen, if you have any questions about the Kyle or, or the brand, um, or, or listen, uh, if you just want to drink it, buddy, late at night, because I need one, um, please feel free to call. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jeff. I just want to say one thing. On behalf of Winebow, thank you for being such a valued partner. Like, you, you, you guys have opened up your doors to us and let you work on projects with you. I mean, that is a true partnership. And so... We are here for you during these times and thank you for your understanding and your support to our community and to our sales team. So we really, there, there's not a better partner and we really thank you and all your efforts and, you know, cheers. Well, 
Well, listen, and Jessica saying that, uh, you guys coming here and um, it, it's vice versa. Uh, we don't know everything, but we want to learn. And we learned so much from your team and from your visit uh, that was here. It was invaluable um, from, you know, from your entire team that you brought to New York and, you know, and then Lupta came up. And so uh, I, I can't thank you guys enough for what you've done for us as a company moving forward. Well, I look forward all of us um, getting together soon and raising a glass in person. Well, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers to that. Somewhere not in our house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Jeff, thank you so much. We love you. We love your team. Yeah. Gustavo, you're the best. Really appreciate you being here and making that cocktail for us. Uh, to the entire Winebow team, you're, the, you're amazing. And um, I, I look forward to seeing more informative stuff on, on raising a glass. Um, love you all. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. And hopefully we'll see thank you, you soon. Thank you for joining us. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye. Amazing.